Thank you to Exter for sponsoring this video. Exter has created the perfect slim wallet in terms of both look and functionality. Exter wallets are far superior to the classic bifold that most people are familiar with, and certainly more comfortable in the pocket. The leather wallet has additional space and would make a great everyday carry. The aluminum is high quality and durable for a more active lifestyle. There's also a simple but ingenious mechanism that really sets Exter apart from other slim wallets, and that is this button right here that allows you quick access to your cards. If there was one issue I had with other slim wallets, it was difficulty with card access, and Exter has fixed that. They also offer a tracking device that you can simply slip into the wallet itself, and you will never lose your wallet again. Exter really has created a superb wallet, and they have been a great pleasure to work with. By clicking the link in the description, you can get 20% off your order, or even up to 30% off depending on your purchase amount. So if you're thinking about buying a new wallet or looking for a gift for Father's Day, click the link in the description. It helps out this channel as well as a great company. The disappearance of Henry McCabe has been a frequently requested topic on this channel. The case is likely most well known for the piece of phone call audio that is directly related to Henry's story. No doubt if you are familiar with this case, you probably remember it because of this strange phone call. Interestingly, few details are even brought up about the events that occurred the night Henry disappeared. As with most cases on this channel, this video is intended to bring clarity to a case that seems shrouded in mystery. The disappearance of Henry McCabe is actually quite complex, and I will do my best to accurately and simply relate the details of the people and events that led to his eventual death. On September 8th of 2015, Moundsview Police Department received a call from a man named Timothy, who wanted to report his friend as missing. An officer was then dispatched to meet with Timothy and take the report. He was informed that 32-year-old Henry McCabe was missing. Henry was a Liberian man who lived in Moundsview, just north of Minneapolis, and worked as an auditor for the Minnesota Department of Revenue. Timothy told the officer that he had last spoken to Henry three days ago on September 5th, and nothing was out of the ordinary at the time. One day after that, Henry had tried calling Timothy, but he was unable to talk to him. Timothy said that the door to Henry's apartment was unlocked, so the officer went ahead and looked inside. However, the apartment was clean and nothing appeared suspicious. Timothy told officers that he tried calling around to numerous hospitals, but had no luck. He stated that Henry had no history of depression or mental health issues. He alerted officers to the fact that Henry is married to a woman named Kareen, who lived in Brooklyn Center, and that she had also not heard from Henry. Every call that went through to Henry's phone would go straight to voicemail. The officer secured Henry's apartment and told Timothy to contact police if he heard from Henry. Later that evening, another officer would call Kareen McCabe after she had also filed a missing persons report with Moundsview Police. Kareen stated that she had spoken with one of Henry's friends, named Jonathan. Jonathan told her that he was at a club with Henry and a man named William on the night of the disappearance. Jonathan said that William had dropped Henry off at a Super America gas station after the club closed, because Henry didn't want to give him his address. Jonathan was also in possession of Henry's wallet. Kareen stated that she had checked bank records and noticed that Henry had taken out $200 in cash. She also said that she was currently in California for work and had been gone since August 14th. She said that the last time she spoke with Henry on September 7th was at 2.23 a.m. and that he sounded delirious. Apparently, Kareen had called Timothy that night and begged him to go get Henry because she knew something was wrong. Moundsview police then contacted Jonathan to confirm this account of the night Henry disappeared. Jonathan told police that they had been at a club called C'est La Vie in Spring Lake Park that night, and he still had Henry's wallet with everything in it. Jonathan stated that William gave Henry a ride. Later that night, Jonathan would be on a phone call with Henry, 
and said that Henry told him that he was at home, but it didn't sound like he was. Not long afterwards, he said it sounded like Henry got into an altercation while on the phone. Jonathan claimed that nothing bad happened at the club that night, but that Henry had a lot to drink. Detectives then moved on to speak with William, who was the third man involved that evening, and had given Henry a ride. William said that he had met up with Henry earlier in the night at a barbecue. The two men were only acquaintances, having only met once before. Afterwards, William followed Henry to his home where they hung out for a while. Henry asked William if he could get a ride to the club so he could meet up with a friend, and William obliged. William then gave Henry a ride first to a TCF bank, then to Say La Vie where he stated Henry hung out with Jonathan for most of the night. When it was time to leave, Henry came over to William's vehicle for a ride. Henry sat in the passenger seat as William drove him home. During this time, Henry had a phone call with his wife. The two argued and Henry apparently hung up on her. Henry then asked to be dropped off at a Super America on Highway 65 at 73rd Avenue. The time was between 2 and 2.15 a.m. when William dropped Henry off at the gas station. Afterwards, he said he went straight home. William said that Henry had been drinking that night, and Jonathan had taken his wallet to keep him from buying more alcohol. The last time William saw Henry, he was walking to the side of the gas station. William had been willing to give Henry a ride home that night, and he did not know why Henry insisted on being dropped off at the gas station. Detectives spoke with Henry's co-workers and supervisors at the Department of Revenue. Here they learned very little except that Henry had recently had a poor work review and had expressed that he would like to move to California. Co-workers also stated that he had some emotions over family troubles, but never said anything specific. Detectives went to the Super America gas station to review surveillance footage of the night in question. They were unable to find footage showing Henry being dropped off at the gas station, however. They also did not see William's red vehicle show up at any point during the time frame he stated he would have been there. Surveillance footage was successfully pulled from a TCF bank location where Henry walked up to a drive through ATM and withdrew $200 at 11.24 p.m., roughly two hours before he disappeared. In the video, he appears intoxicated and unsteady on his feet. On September 14th, detectives spoke with Corrine McCabe again. She told them that on the night in question, she had called Timothy to pick up Henry because Henry was not making any sense while she was on the phone with him. The details of this phone call are important. Kareen was already on a phone call with Henry. During this call, she contacted Timothy, thereby creating a three-way phone call. Timothy did not answer the phone, but his voicemail recorded the last moments of the call that was happening between Corrine and Henry. This voicemail recording, as previously stated, is often the focal point of this disappearance. In other videos and news media sites on the internet, you will only be able to find roughly 10 to 15 seconds of the voicemail. The full length of the recording is actually over two minutes long. I was able to get the full voicemail and I'm going to play it here in its entirety. Be advised that while we really have no understanding of what is happening on the tape, some viewers may still find it somewhat alarming.
As you can hear from the recording, what's being said is very difficult to discern. It does sound as though Henry is talking to someone, whether this is Kareen or someone else is unclear. In a very odd fashion, it goes from talking to grunting and screaming, then some more talking, followed by more screaming and crying before the call cuts off completely. I played this tape many times and could never definitively identify any words being spoken, but I would invite any viewers who are more experienced in the field of audio technology than I am to see if they can clean the recording up in any way. Corrine told authorities that the call was very out of character for Henry, who she said is usually very intelligent and articulate. She said the call sounds to her like Henry was intoxicated and his words are slurred. The call came in at 2.28 a.m., not long after the 2 to 2.15 time frame William gave when he dropped Henry off at the gas station. The following day on September 15th, Corrine again spoke with authorities and told them that Henry had been offered a job in the Liberian government. She said it was his goal to eventually return to Liberia and run for president, but he wanted to first finish his master's in CPA while also saving up more money. She said that Henry's dad was a politician in Liberia who was poisoned and killed, which forced Henry and his brothers to flee the country and they could not return until the president was no longer in power. Corrine wondered if perhaps Henry had secretly traveled back to Liberia. Police received Henry's phone records on September 16th and noticed his phone made a call at 3.26 a.m. on September 7th, the same night he disappeared. Henry's phone had called the number 24 times that day. The number was again called on September 9th and 10th, after Henry was reported missing. Police found that the number was registered to a cell phone in Texas, and when they tried to call the number, they received a message saying the number was no longer in service. Detectives re-interviewed Jonathan to clarify some details from the night of September 7th. Jonathan stated that when he arrived at the club, he saw Henry in the VIP section. Henry then came over and handed his wallet to Jonathan while saying he owed him for not taking him out for his birthday. He would see Henry on and off throughout the night until he was suddenly gone. Jonathan said he stayed until the club closed, but Henry was not there, and he had a missed call from him at 1.50 a.m. Corrine called Jonathan at 2.09 a.m. and said that Henry was acting crazy. Jonathan then called Henry with Corrine on the line, and Henry told him, Don't mind that woman, she drives me crazy. He also said that he was one minute from his house. Jonathan figured that since Henry was almost home, there was nothing to worry about. That was the last time he heard from Henry. On September 17th, Moundsview police and an FBI agent met with a confidential informant. The informant stated that he had been friends with Henry McCabe for a long time, though he knew him as Joseph McCabe. The two had often talked about Henry's political aspirations back in Liberia. The informant told police that he believed Henry was dead and he wanted his friend to receive a proper burial. He then related a story where he was at a search party that occurred on September 12th and noticed a group of four men standing together away from the search party and talking to each other. When he approached the group, they immediately quieted down and split up. The informant knew the names of all four men and later tried to contact them all independently saying that he knew what they did. One of the men apparently stated that he did not want to talk about it over the phone. One of the names the informant mentioned was Emmanuel, the man who hosted the barbecue at his house on September 7th. This was the same barbecue Henry attended where he met up with William. The informant reportedly asked Emmanuel what happened at the barbecue at his house and Emmanuel responded with, I am not going to be involved and I am not going to talk about it. The informant responded with, Your friend killed my friend and I want to know why. Sometime later, the informant received a call from Emmanuel's brother saying that they could not talk on the phone and needed to meet face to face to talk. The two apparently agreed to meet at a later date. Whatever may have happened at this meeting is not disclosed in the police records. 
and the confidential informant provides no evidence to back his belief that any of these men were involved in the death of Henry McCabe. The informant also told police that he listened to the voicemail and heard Henry yell that he is from Lofa County, which is where he is from in Liberia, and also that Henry says he has vu in an attempt to tell people that were around him that they will be possessed by a demon if they hurt him. He said the rest of the recording is Henry screaming for help. Authorities contacted Emmanuel on October 1st. Emmanuel said that he had got a phone call from Henry on September 7th after Henry found out he wasn't invited to the barbecue. Emmanuel told Henry that he could come over if he wanted to, which he did, and afterwards everything seemed fine. He said that Henry left between 10 and 11 p.m. that evening. Emmanuel stated that he had spoken with William about what happened that night, and William said that he did not even know Henry and had no intentions of hurting anyone. He said that William was shook up over the incident. On October 2nd, an anonymous letter was delivered to New Brighton PD. New Brighton is just south of Moundsview. The letter was posted on October 1st from St. Paul. It said, Henry McCabe, his body next to water, partially buried, needs search dog to find, witness who saw burial scared, female, young, asked to come forward, can remain anonymous and will protect. On October 9th, Corrine McCabe contacted investigators and shared that she was able to look up the Google Timeline application on Henry's phone, which showed his locations and movements. On the night of September 7th, it showed that Henry was in Spring Lake Park. The last known location on the timeline was near the intersection of Rice Creek Road and Benjamin Street in the city of Fridley. Afterwards, his cell phone either stopped functioning or the GPS was turned off. An officer was dispatched to that area and noticed a holiday gas station nearby. The officer spoke with the station manager to review surveillance footage from the night of September 7th and discovered footage of what appeared to be Henry McKay being dropped off at the station around 1.58 a.m. The vehicle he was in then drives off while Henry begins walking towards Old Central Avenue. The location where the Holiday gas station is is roughly 2.5 miles south of where William had claimed to drop Henry off. The wooded area nearby was searched, but nothing was located. Afterwards, investigators went back to William to question him about the newly found gas station video. William stated that it was likely him dropping Henry off because everything matched up. He reiterated his story from the night of September 7th, saying that he planned on leaving by himself, but as he was leaving, Henry came up and got into the passenger seat. Henry was on the phone and so William started driving, though he didn't know directions to Henry's house. When Henry got off the phone finally, William asked for directions and Henry told him to just stop at the gas station. He told detectives that he must have stopped at the Holiday gas station and that he hadn't been paying attention and didn't realize he had driven that far. William's wife verified that he got home around 2.25 a.m. that night. William denied doing anything to Henry that night and stated many people are blaming him for what happened and accusing him of lying to police. By October 15th, two separate individuals had approached police indicating that they believed Corrine McCabe was not being entirely truthful. Both shared stories of her telling them that she had withheld information from police and that she knew that Henry was alive but couldn't say how she knew. Investigators decided to interview Corrine McCabe again on October 23rd. During the interview, they brought up the fact that call records showed that after Henry left the voicemail on September 7th, Corrine never tried to call him back. Corrine said that she had been tired and went to bed. Detectives told her that they found this odd considering the disturbing voicemail Henry had left. They also brought up the fact that Corrine initially told police that the voicemail was the result of a misdial but call logs showed that she had been on the phone with Henry for two minutes before she called Timothy's voicemail. Corrine said that she could not remember what they had been talking about. She then stated that she believed Henry was alive, but didn't have any evidence to directly prove it. 
On November 2nd, New Brighton PD was dispatched to Rush Lake for a reported body found in the water. Police retrieved the body from the lake and it was taken to the Ramsey County Medical Examiner's office. Detectives were present for the autopsy that was conducted and found that the decedent had a cell phone in his pocket, a VIP wristband from a club, and a gold wedding band. Dental records were used to positively identify the body as that of Henry McCabe. The medical examiner stated there were no signs of trauma to the body that would indicate foul play. Investigators found that it would have been highly probable for Henry to have ended up in Rush Lake if he had continued walking down Rice Creek Road. The area where Henry was found was over two miles from the location where he was dropped off. On November 18th, the medical examiner ruled the official cause of death as a probable drowning in fresh water with no evidence of traumatic injuries. Analysis of the liver showed that Henry's blood alcohol content was around 0.053, but could have been higher at the time of death. Moundsview police state that they found no evidence of foul play in the case. The disappearance and death of Henry McCabe has no satisfactory conclusion. The investigation into this matter shows how investigators can be inundated with multiple different tips, theories, and angles. Sometimes these different trails lead nowhere. Other times they seem to lead somewhere, but there is a lack of necessary evidence. Undoubtedly, the single greatest factor that seems to indicate foul play in this case is the audio recording that perhaps captures the sounds of an attack. What exactly is happening during the recording is unclear. I've heard some theories say that the sounds are that of a man being forcibly drowned by an unknown number of assailants. Others have postulated that the sounds heard on the audio aren't human and some paranormal entity is involved. While many individuals came forward to express their beliefs that foul play was a factor in Henry's death, none of them had any concrete supporting evidence or could point to any specific person and say, they did it. There is obviously many missing details in this case. We don't know why Henry wanted to be dropped off at a gas station instead of his own home, if things did happen that way. And we don't know anything of what happened to him after he was dropped off, or how he made it into Rush Lake. The only things we know for certain are the timeline. Police know Henry was dropped off at the gas station at 1.58 a.m. The bizarre voicemail came in at 2.28 a.m. If Henry was a fast walker, it is conceivable that he walked the roughly two miles to Rush Lake, but given his inebriated state, it seems unlikely. In the voicemail, it sounds like Henry is talking to someone in his presence, so it seems more likely that Henry got picked up by one or multiple people. Who they are, we simply don't know. There is also the lingering mystery of Henry's phone records. He called an unknown number 24 times on the night he disappeared. His phone records showed calls to this number up until three days after he vanished. Authorities never discovered who this number belonged to. Either Henry or someone else was making calls on that phone up until September 10th. The phone was eventually found in Henry's pants pocket when his body was discovered. All of these details would seem to point to a death that is not at all accidental. Unfortunately, authorities seem to have met many dead ends in their search for the truth, which will likely never be fully known unless some witness comes forward in the future. Until next time, thanks for watching.